Welcome back, and thank you for joining me for episode three of our Spine Talk on the subject of spondylolisthesis. My name is Brett Friedman, and I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In this episode, we'll discuss the symptoms associated with spondylolisthesis and how this condition is diagnosed. What are the symptoms of spondylolisthesis? The most common symptom attributed to spondylolisthesis is back pain. The second most common location for symptoms is in your legs. Any slippage can reduce the space for the nerves, and with enough slippage mixed with normal aging changes and some scar that can occur in the area of a pars defect in the setting of a lytic type of slip, space for the nerves can become narrowed or stenotic. When this space becomes too tight, you can get symptoms of nerve pinch. These include pain or tingling sensation radiating down your leg, these radiating symptoms can become worse when your leg is straightened or when you stand up, especially in the case of a degenerative spondylolisthesis. You may notice that you feel more comfortable leaning forward when you walk. For instance, you may prefer to lean on a shopping cart when you walk at the store. As nerve pinch gets worse, you can get numbness or weakness in your legs. Your legs can start to feel wobbly or your balance can diminish. In advanced cases, you can even develop difficulties with urinating or defecating. As opposed to leg symptoms, where there is a clear connection between cause and effect, the nerve pinch causes the leg symptom. Back pain in the setting of spondylolisthesis can occur for many reasons. Only back pain related to the abnormal alignment or the abnormal motion of the spine would likely be due to the spondylolisthesis. So only that part of your back pain would have any chance of getting better with spine surgery. It's because leg symptoms are specifically due to nerve pinch, but back pain is nonspecific, meaning it can have many causes, that treatments for spondylolisthesis are far more effective at reducing or relieving leg symptoms than they are at improving back pain. The back pain that occurs with a spondylolisthesis tends to be mechanical. This means it's worse with activity and better with rest. It's not uncommon to experience or hear a clunking sensation at the base of your spine when you move from a fully bent forward to a standing upright position as the spinal bones move along each other in an abnormal fashion. When we suspect a spondylolisthesis, we will commonly obtain a set of x-rays in which you bend forward and lean backwards. This can show the spinal bones moving abnormally in relationship to each other. When we see this, we term this a mobile spondylolisthesis. A general rule of thumb in spine surgery is that the more abnormal and unique a finding is on imaging, the more likely performing surgery to improve that finding will result in a meaningful clinical response. For instance, all discs age and all discs eventually develop protrusions or bulges. So when we see a patient whose only abnormality on imaging is a degenerated disc with bulges, we're less sure that the surgery will be beneficial since many, many people walk the face of the earth symptom-free who have the exact same imaging findings. But when we see a slip, and then when we see the slip moves, and then when we see that the space for the nerves is reduced, and then the patient develops leg symptoms, we become more and more confident that performing surgery to correct the anatomic problem will improve the patient's condition. This is always the biggest challenge in spine surgery. We can perform surgery perfectly with excellent technical results, which means the implants are well placed, the nerves are fully decompressed, the spine is well aligned and it goes on to fuse, and the patients can still fail to achieve the benefit they and we want. It's because we know this is a risk, and numerically it's probably one of the most common risks associated with sp spinal surgery, that we try to take the time to fully explain each spinal condition, the treatment options, and the realistic expectations of each. This video is an extension of those efforts. In my clinic, in addition to spending ample face-to-face -face time discussing these issues, we provide patients with detailed information sheets that reiterate the topics we discuss in clinic. In the end, if you ever do elect to undergo surgery, you must first feel like you have a reasonable understanding of the risk and benefits of the procedure. It's my experience that the more patients understand about their condition and their treatment option, 
the more likely they are to be accepting of their final outcome. While these are very important points to discuss, I don't want to stray too far from the focus of our talk, which is the symptoms associated with spondylolisthesis and how this condition is diagnosed. Diagnosing spondylolisthesis is simple and straightforward. After this talk, you yourself could probably make the diagnosis. We obtain upright x-rays to show that the slip is present. We can obtain flexion extension x-rays to see if the slip moves. We can obtain an x-ray of your entire spine while you're standing to see how well you're aligned and to see how well your spinal column holds you in a nice upright posture. We typically will obtain an MRI to see if the nerves are being pinched. This can also tell us if there are additional findings like a facet cyst present. We can obtain a CT scan to confirm there is a PARS defect in the setting of a lytic spondylolisthesis. Based on the results of these studies, we can also conclude whether we believe that spondylolisthesis alone is the best explanation for your problems, or if additional findings are also contributing. If we do progress to surgery, this determination will tell us how much and what type of surgery is best indicated to provide you the best chance of success with the least exposure to risk. Now that we've described the symptoms associated with spondylolisthesis, as well as how it's diagnosed, I hope you'll join us for episode four in this series, in which we'll describe the treatment options and prognosis for this common condition of the spine. Again, I'm Dr. Brett Friedman of the Mayo Clinic, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and it's been a pleasure spending this time together with you. I really appreciate your willingness to listen to this spine talk. If after reviewing all the episodes in this series, you have additional questions or would like to request an appointment to be seen at the Mayo Clinic for your spinal condition, please use the information displayed on the screen to contact us. Thank you and be well.